ever constructed a mirror this big before. So just how did Hex engineers do it and shape it into the exact right curve? And how does a weird sounding musical instrument provide the answer? In astronomy, there's a simple rule. Biggest is best. That's why the designers of the Keck Observatory want to create what is going to be the world's largest telescope mirror to see further into space than ever before. But making a mirror 33 feet wide presents them with a mighty problem if they try to construct it from a single piece of glass. Nature seemed to have decided how big a mirror could be. This is a piece of plastic, similar properties to glass, and it's pretty sturdy. But triple its size, and suddenly, well, it sags in the middle. It hasn't got sufficient strength to hold itself up. The only way to make it stronger at this size would be to make it thicker. But then it would be heavier, and you need a lot more to support it. It's a vicious circle. The larger the glass, the heavier it is. And to brace it against gravity, it needs support and reinforcement, which only makes it heavier and increasingly expensive. Just over 16 feet seems to be about as big as astronomers can go. But Kex engineers need a mirror almost four times as big. So they come up with a pioneering design that transforms astronomy. Instead of creating a single huge mirror, they use 36 hexagonal segments that fit together. But making a big mirror out of little ones creates a new problem. You need to arrange each segment so it lines up exactly with its neighbors and makes a smooth, continuous surface. If it doesn't, the mirror won't make the perfect curve to focus the light accurately. The solution lies in a weird-sounding musical instrument called the theremin. In 1919, Leon Theremin, a Russian inventor, experiments to create a sensor for an alarm system. He ends up creating a musical instrument. Tom Bach of Sensitech Research, an expert in electric field sensors, shows me the instrument. OK, Tom, talk me through it. It's making a noise already. What is it? What does it do? Well, this object measures the changes of electric field. As you, as you bring your hand in, we're distorting the electric field that's been created around that rod. Right, so hang on. I, I don't, I'm going to play this now. It's like that's a right. theremin. That's right. And it's like an instrument. And I don't touch it. I just... No. Get... No. <laughs> well, it's very, very clever. But is it of any use whatsoever? Oh, yes, it will measure the presence of anything that will distort that field. It doesn't have to be a metal object. It can be uh, a gas or a chemical or the human body moving in and out. Or you can put it in an engine to measure how fast the engine's, in, engine's going. Uh, you could even theoretically, by turning that magnification up, you could watch the moon go over. Well, not done it then. It can tell you when the moon <laughs> goes over. Well, yeah, no, that's an idea. A lot of these things are theoretical. But you could, yeah, theoretically, it'd be fun to try that. And it's very sensitive, because a tiny yeah. movement makes a tiny difference. Yeah, it does. So. Yeah, yeah, that does. It seems there's almost no limit to what these sensors can detect. To prove it, Tom devises a little test for me, finding a needle in a haystack. Well, one slightly different tennis ball out of 500. While my back is turned, Tom injects a little bit of water into a tennis ball. Theremin-type sensors detect the tiniest disturbance to the electric fields around them. It can be hands waving about, or just a little bit of liquid that makes one ball conduct electricity slightly differently, so it will clearly stand out among the 500 other balls. Tom sets me to find the doctored ball. First of all, without a sensor. And I can give you too much help here. You've well, got to so find... It's just some invisible difference. <laughs> yep, yep. 
Uh, uh, there's only 500 of them here, so that shouldn't be hard. You got to try. Um, you got to really, really try. You know? Are they different weights? Are they? Oh, well, that, that would take days. I can't pick every one up. If I could detect changes in electrical fields, finding it would be a walk in the park. Clearly, I'm not, I'm not going to find it. OK, well, we made you something that's an electric field sensor, so it will, it will find changes in the electric field. So you should be able to use this to find it. So this works, yep. I'm guessing, the same as... But a bit like the theremin, but, but it's a more... Uh, so I just uh, ...more sensitive, yeah. All right. Intuition, logic, are all useless. <laughs> all <here>. useless, I think. <laughs> so it's just that noise that I'm waiting for. Hang on. Got it. Is that it? Yeah, it's got it. I've got it. It's just that difference compared to an ordinary one. That's right. It doesn't feel any different. It doesn't look any different. No. Good. That's one sensitive machine. So how do the sensors used in a weird musical instrument help the Keck astronomers build their enormous mirror out of 36 segments? That's where the theremin comes in. Engineers use theremin-type sensors to measure the electrical fields wherever two segments meet. The sensors are so sensitive, they will detect a misalignment of just nanometers. Just as they spotted the doctored tennis ball, engineer Craig Nance shows me Keck sensors. This is one of the segments that we've removed that front surface aluminum coating so you can see all of what's going on behind the glass. So all of this machinery then is constantly measuring and adjusting where this particular mirror is in relation to the rest of it. That's right. About twice per second, these sensors are being used to figure out where the segment is located and then command it as needed to adjust so that the entire array of mirrors maintains that wonderful optical shape that we need. And let me guess, the movements, the adjustments are kind of small and precise. That's right, they are. The optical tolerances we're looking at are about one one thousandth of the thickness of a human hair. Well, so you've got to position it That's to right. within... And this That's is right. just a position to the one next to it. That's right. Within one one thousandth of the thickness. Of a That's hair. very precise. That is. Making a mirror out of segments like this is a brilliant solution and it also reduces weight. Astonishingly, though the whole Keck mosaic mirror is four times as big as the previous biggest single mirror, it doesn't weigh any more. Theremin sensors allow Keck's mirrors to provide such clarity and resolution that they can distinguish each headlight on a car 500 miles away. It's mesmerizing to look at the mirror itself because I guess most of us never see such a, such a perfectly made thing. And quite expensive, I imagine. Well, when they were built, roughly speaking, about a million dollars each, we, we treat them as, as the most precious things we have. But a perfectly aligned mirror isn't all it takes to see amazing images from space. The glass itself needs to be perfectly polished and not just a quick rub down with a cloth, no. This is polishing on an incredibly small scale. Think of literally polishing atom by atom and you're getting close. So how on earth do you achieve it with something like this? 
a sandblaster. 